All right. So, Dr. Cesar Corso, welcome to this fine podcast show. Thank you very much, Marcio. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a it's a blast to have you here, a good friend. And um, I guess for those that don't know, if you can just share your your journey so far and uh, what you're doing today. Sure, sure, Marcio. So um, uh, I'm originally from Colombia. So I got my DVM in Colombia in uh, 2002. And towards the end of my career in Colombia, I had the chance to, to get involved with pigs, you know. Uh, so I'm talking late 90s when uh, a lot of the purse outbreaks were occurring. Uh, I started asking about, about the disease. Uh, the vaccine had just arrived. Uh, and that's when I learned about uh, population medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started asking, so how many swine vets are there in my country? You know, not that many. It's a small industry. I guess Colombia today may have 150,000, 180,000 sows. Okay. Um, and that's when I decided to, uh, to explore opportunities in different countries as far as graduate programs. And then uh, that's how I ended up going to Guelph, the University of Guelph, uh, under Dr. Bob Friendship's uh, uh, direction. And I got my master's there from 2002 to 2004. I learned uh, a lot about epidemiology. Uh, my thesis was on Lausonia. At that time, it was the big problem, Lausonia, iliitis. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent two years there. Then I went back home, and I joined the Elanco team as the swine technical consultant. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started visiting customers uh, within my country. And then I started going to the Andean region, southern corn, uh, southern corn region, then the Caribbean and the Caribbean basin, right? Uh, and then Central America. In that journey, that was roughly three to four years, uh, I learned a lot about, um, of course, pharmaceuticals, uh, diseases, different diseases. Uh, but then I kept in contact with a person that I met at Guelph, he was visiting, which is Dr. John Dean. And Dr. John Dean put me in contact with Dr. Bob Morrison, mm -hmm. who invited me to join his group in uh, 2008. That's when uh, I was happy to accept the invitation. So I joined uh, Dr. Morrison in 2008, at the end of 2008, finished my PhD uh, under his and uh, Dr. Mariko Haynes' direction in 2012. And that's when I went to PAC uh, mm -hmm. to work as a health, uh, to lead the health team, basically for the Latin American region. Uh, and then in 2017, I joined the University of Minnesota as the layman chair in swine health and productivity. Uh, but also at the same time, I, in, I inherited uh, a big project, which is the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project. Uh, so that, that's what I do today. I'm at the university trying to, trying to contribute uh, with uh, as much as I can from a research standpoint. I love it. How does it feel to, to sit on a limo's chair? It's a huge responsibility, Marcel. It's a huge responsibility. You get pulled in many different directions. Uh, in many very interesting directions, you know, uh, and, and, and you feel like, uh, like uh, you need to do more, right? Um, there's so many opportunities out there. There's a huge responsibility that we all have. Uh, and I'm just trying to go baby steps, a baby step at a time, you know, because the questions are just too large, they're too big. And we can't answer a large question with one single research project, as you know very well, right? Yeah. So uh, it's, it's been great, you know, and, and the industry has been very supportive and uh, it's, it's great to be in an industry where you can just pick up the phone, call someone and ask for their thoughts. And they, they're, they're kind to pretty much give you what you want, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's been a, a great experience. Super cool. So, and for those that don't know the M Shimp or the Morrison Science Health uh, Monitoring Program. Uh, can you give some highlights there? But also comment on other countries that may not have a system like that. Yes, Marcia. And this is, uh, I have to go back to, uh, I think I have to go back to the late 2000s, you know, when, uh, when uh, PERS, con well, of course, PERS continues to be a frustration for the industry, not only in the US, but in many countries. But uh, in the U.S., there were a lot of questions uh, as, far as, as far as occurrence, right? And uh, in the late 2000s, a lot of people started asking themselves, how do we know if PERS this year is worse than last year's PERS mm -hmm. season? 
And that's when Dr. Bob Morrison got together with uh, practitioners and they said, well, why don't we put together your data and his data and we start counting cases, right? Uh, so I, I believe this occurred in 2010. That's when the, the, the project started, you know. And little by little, companies and practices started joining that initiative just to try to understand uh, the trends, right? And I feel like that was the, that was the, the, a very important step in the sense that that provided a platform for people to share data uh, in that to the, a, few days, a few years ago it was purse, right? But then that they realized very quickly this can be good for any other disease, right? So as time went by, uh, one of our students was able to describe very nicely the trend of PERS within the U.S. So they could see that the outbreak would start in the fall and would end in the winter or, or early, early spring. So they said, well, since we've been talking about foreign animal diseases, why don't we use this platform that we have created for PERS for other diseases? And that's when the Morrison Swine Health uh, Monitoring Project actually became way more important in the sense that a lot of breeding herds were reporting to Dr. Morrison their status on a weekly basis. So that already created a system that was working. It was, it continues to be voluntary and people just tell, hey, my farm 37 broke with this type of, of a purse. And that was, I think the main, uh, the main piece of information that everybody was looking for, because now you know when to be careful with the biosecurity procedures, where do you need to start fine tuning your procedures, but not until 2013 when PED striked in the US, uh, that's when they said, well, here it is, we're gonna put this tool to test, mm -hmm. right? And again, the same thing happened. So at that time, Dr. Morrison had the opportunity to say, okay, why don't you report to me if you have cases or not? And that became pretty much the, 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 the reporting tool for the industry. And that's how today we can say that between 2013 and 2014, pretty much half of the industry or half of the herds, breeding herds in the industry became positive for, the, for PED. So having said that, uh, I think Bob had clear in his mind that this collaborative effort which is a project from the industry and for the industry, it had to keep going on, right? And what I say going on is we need to add more tools, right? We, today we know how to count cases. Now we need to start thinking about how can we track movement, right? So that we can, we can be better prepared should an emergency occur, right? Uh, on top of that, we, also, we are also working with sequences, right? To try to help producers understand uh, disease spread, you know? Because a lot of people are doing a lot of testing and sequencing, but not everybody has the opportunity to go out there and compare those sequences in time and space. We have that capability today, and we've actually put out some, some, some abstracts out there. Um, but again, at the end of the day, what we're doing is, how can we provide a tool that if tomorrow ASF comes into the country, knock on wood, uh, we can aid in that procedure of uh, uh, tracing back pick movements, understanding the outbreak, understanding the density around that uh, index case. And that's what uh, the Morrison Trend Health Monitoring Project is today. A tool that provides you uh, valuable information from an endemic disease standpoint, but it also works towards being ready should an emergency like a uh, ASF outbreak of course, which I hope we don't have to test the project with ASF. Right. Wow, what, what a great legacy, right, from Dr. Morrison. Yes, 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 yes. And, and I think Bob, uh, Bob had this, uh, Bob was really, it was really good with people, you know, and Bob was able to convince anyone. And, uh, and I remember when I started my PhD with him, uh, that he got me involved with PERS regional projects. That's when I, under, I started understanding where he wanted to get to, right? Because pretty much a regional project is what we do today, uh, of course, at a different scale. But with the regional project, 
he started asking, why don't you share the farm status with me so that we can create a map, as simple as a map. And it's amazing to see the reaction of producers when you put them in the same room, share them, share with them a map so that people can understand what the situation is. And it's, it's very interesting to see how they are willing to help each other. Marcia, I, I saw in so many different occasions with so many different practitioners and producers, uh, everybody working towards how can we clean the region. And, uh, and I think today we see that. So I think Bob found a way to uh, listen very carefully, uh, find the specific words to get people to, uh, to voluntarily share their data. You know, I think a few days, maybe a decade ago, that wasn't very frequent. Today, I think people are starting to feel more comfortable with sharing the data. Uh, and when I say data, is today in our, in our servers, we have uh, locations, we have prem ID, we have uh, uh, herd sizes, we have statuses. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of people wouldn't like to share their statuses for X, Y, Z reason. Uh, but today, everybody's pretty comfortable with that because I guess today we know that if I have purse, that's not a sin, right? Uh, anybody can have flu, you know, you and I can have flu today and COVID tomorrow. And I mean, that's what we're trying to do. If I have COVID, I'm going to share it to my friends so that I don't get them infected, right? <laughs> the same thing with purse, you know, I think we're, we're, we're working on, on that direction as well. That's amazing. Um, do you still have some producers that, that don't want to share? You know, I think from when I look at the the top forty pork powerhouses, mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean that's a that's a that's a measure we use every now and then. Uh, out of those top forty, I believe we have uh, twenty six or twenty seven of those companies sharing information. And not that we have all of their sales, but if we don't have them all, we have a big portion of that. Now those that are not that are not participating for some reason uh, they do not want to participate uh, just because maybe they don't have a team that can support with the transfer of data you know on a weekly basis mm -hmm. they're just busy because that's one of the things that we ask when we're enrolling participants mm -hmm. do you have a person that can share with us these statuses on a weekly basis and from all of the participants it's either the practitioner or someone that manages the data for them. So I think in some cases, those that are not enrolled, that could be one of the reasons. And the other ones, maybe we haven't contacted them yet, right? Okay. Um, and then any comment on other countries? Uh, is there, I mean, I'm not familiar. I'm sure there's some countries that might have something similar, but I bet most don't. So what's your thoughts there? And that, that's a good question, Marcio, and, 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 and I'm with you, you know, I don't know of any other countries that share data voluntarily. They do go, uh, they do share the data uh, through a regulatory process. Uh, right. You know, the, some countries in South America come to mind, yep. specifically those that, that, are, that have a good network of uh, diagnostic labs, any positive result, they're going to go to a central location, right? And that's when it becomes a little bit more regulatory. In this case, because it's all voluntary, uh, I don't think people have to worry about reporting or not uh, to the country. They're just doing it because they want to help. Uh, they want to help by providing the data. And just like as they're helping, they expect others to help as well, you know? And I think that's what the power of this data set is today, you know, that we have pretty much half of the breeding herd of the United States in our graphs that we, we generate a report on a weekly basis and people get to see what's happening. So for example, last, maybe a couple of weeks ago, the purse epidemic started again, and we wouldn't be able to tell the industry when the epidemic started if it wasn't for them uh, sharing their cases, right? So it's unfortunate to share, hey, I, two of my hearts broke, but at the end of the day, everybody knows, okay, there we go again the same trend that we have seen in the last 10 years. Right. Mm. And then when it comes to PED, for example, right, uh, what percentage of the herds on the report right now? It's a very low percentage, right? It's, it's positive. Yeah, so, so incidence-wise, we, we're now in the last, uh, no, since uh, 2014, 2015, we've been at one digit. 
And when I say one digit is we went from the 45% to, to nine, seven, six. Uh, so this year alone, we didn't see a single case between May uh, end of May, and I believe it was mid-September or early October. I can't remember the dates very well. So there was a big window of time where we didn't get a single report, right? So today we have roughly 5% of the hertz breaking, you know, and, and, that, and we have roughly 1,000 hertz. So that's very few farms that continue to break with PEV, you know. So that's, nothing that, uh, that's something that it's not very frequent nowadays given that we have a lot of PED in the finishing barns, right? So I think everybody's doing their due diligence on uh, biosecurity, and I think everybody's being successful so far. Right, but do you think this last few percentage, is that something that's going to continue, continue for a long time or not? What's your thoughts there? And that's a good question, Marcio, and, and, and this is where I like to meet with the participants. So I meet with them as a, as a big group either once or twice a year, and we go through these conversations. Um, and we try, to, we try to gather everybody's thoughts on, are we going to be able to bring this down to zero or not? Um, and we don't see a clear trend, you know, Marcio? We don't see a clear trend of PD being a or hotspots of PD in the same location every year? No, it pops up in South Dakota today and maybe in Nebraska in a few months, and then, I don't know, maybe in North Carolina in the next few months. And then the next year, those same locations, we may not see cases, right? Wow. So it's kind of very erratic. And, uh, and I think that's where, that's where we need to come and understand, well, if we don't have those hotspots, how are we moving that virus, right? And, uh, and of course, now we know that uh, the, the growing pigs, you know, they, they, they tend to get infected with PED as, as they are being marketed, you know, as they're being taken to the slaughter plant. When you think about the next level, right, what is the next level on this type of um, collaboration or innovation or technology? I think, Marshall, where we're headed to is getting closer and closer to real time because today we have there's a lag between the practitioner in the field seeing the clinical science getting the sample getting the test result and then reporting to us there's a lag there of a few days sometimes a week sometimes a couple of weeks and um, so i think the, the closer we get to that the better that's point number one point number two and uh which is actually something that we're working today. And, uh, and here I have to include my team, you know, they, they do a lot of work on this and it's how can we trace the dissemination of disease? So if you're hurt, Mars, your breaks today, well, you're going to have to wean pace anyways the week after, even if it's, let's say it's, it's first, you'll be weaning pace next week. And those pigs may go to different locations. So one, one uh, area we're headed to is how can we track pig movement in real time just so that the status of my breeding farm, uh, once it changes, then as you wean pigs, the status of that growing pig farm is going to match with that breeding herd. And I think that will be able to give us some uh, a real time activity in different regions, you know, so that we know this virus is in the neighborhood. Uh, let's see if this virus is going to jump to another population. So I think the closer we get to that, the better, because then people are going to be, uh, are going to have w maybe more opportunities to react and to prevent, you know, uh, and, and to expect that, okay, the storm is coming, this purse storm is coming, so we need to change things, you know. Or if you need to move gills, well, let's not move them into that side because we know that purse positive pigs are coming our way. And then the other one, Marcia, I think it's once we have uh, the real time of the diagnostics, the real time of the dissemination, I think it's uh, the opposite. How can we start tracking, cleaning up those sites, right? Because that's the other thing we get from our report. People, as hertz break, there's very progressive uh, clinics and companies that they say, yeah, we broke today, but we're going to have to eliminate it in six, nine months, right? And we get that reported as well. So that's the, that's the other way to 
to track how we continue to improve the health of our region, health of our company, you know, uh, because I think it's, it goes both ways, how we lose status and how we regain status. And that's very valuable, you know. I love it. And you, Cesar, you have a very good expertise in PERS, right? So any insights on the epidemiology, the risk factors, or, or even how all that influenced this early trend? That's a good question, Matthew, and that's, uh, and that's something that we still need to work on. You know, there's something that is triggering the epidemic, especially in the Midwest, you know, and that's when we, in our report, we put out a graph, which we call it the EWMA, which is basically smoothing the, 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 the data points. And we can see that that changes by region, you know. So uh, if we compare, I don't know, the, the South or the Southeast with the Midwest, there's a completely different behavior when it comes to purse occurrence. Mm-hmm. Now, the graph that we see at the nation level, it's driven uh, strongly by the Midwest. And we know that in the Midwest, uh, between October and November, something happens. Uh, we don't know exactly what it is uh, at this point, but something happens that just triggers all these outbreaks. The interesting thing is that it's not a, an outbreak that is caused by the same virus. It's just multiple viruses uh, being introduced into pig farms. One thing that it's catching some attention is uh, manure pumping. Uh, we have some data there that uh, there's kind of some associations. We're still in the very early stages and this is work uh, done by uh, Dr. Carlos Villalta within our team. Um, uh, that the more we look at the graph and the more we explore at what are those factors, the one that happens every single year in the Midwest is either you are harvesting and you're pumping, Mm -hmm. right? So we said, why do we see that specifically at this time of the year, right? So we've been doing a little bit of uh, small projects trying to understand how often do we find purse in manure pits. Uh, So a student of ours, uh, Dr. Julian Montoya, he found that we can find purse in manure pits, you know, roughly a 10% of the pits tested positive, uh, a little bit higher when it comes to PED, right? But for purse, we can find it in there. We just don't know. Uh, at this point, we don't know if the virus uh, is alive or not. We couldn't get any live viruses from our project, but we need to do more testing and understanding whether manure pumping and the purse occurrence are actually related from a mechanistic standpoint. Today we see kind of an association, we see kind of that, uh, kind of a temporal relationship. We still need to figure out what's that relationship, what's that mechanism, just to see whether we need to adjust our protocols or not. Wow, that's very interesting. And you are epidemiologist, you know, by training. And how do you, when you mentioned mechanism, you know, mechanism and, you know, cause and effect type of, type of deal. How would, how would you go about that? What's the best way to do that in this type of situation? And there's, there's different scenarios, Marcio. At this point, we're just linking events, right? right. So we link the event of a manure pumping and a, an outbreak. A, and this is when we start thinking about do we need to go and start uh, collecting uh, samples from the manure pumping equipment before it goes onto the farm? Do we need to start uh, conducting some uh, historical or looking at historical records of that manure pumping equipment mm-hmm. uh, just to see where, they, where they're coming from? Uh, that's how we start the investigation. Now, when we, when we want to do a prospective study, and if we want to start doing certain things like interventions, uh, I think we're going to have to start looking at some farms will just continue to do what they do, and other farms, we're going to have to force the manure pumping equipment to go through a specific process. Right. I, I realized today that cleaning and disinfecting manure pumping equipment is going to be a very difficult uh, task. You know, uh, one, two, it's going to bring cost, and three, it's just going to take time, you know, and, uh, and when, when, when we're having this kind of weather, they want to do it fast and efficiently. And if we put this in between, 
this is going to slow down the whole process. So I think those are kind of ways in which we can try to, to start tackling this, uh, this question, you know, because it's not, it's not that easy, you know. And again, I think we're going to have to get more data uh, collected before we get into that kind of uh, field projects. Very cool. And what did you learn, uh, you and the, the industry learn about PERS diversity and, and clusters and time and space? And I almost feel that we were talking about the black hole, right? Time and space. So uh, what, what did you learn there? Well, it's amazing how one virus, and here I'm going to quote uh, the late Dr. Michael Mortag. I remember him saying that, uh, yeah, I remember him saying, that there were way more PERS sequences than HIV sequences. No kidding. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thought. Now, I think PERS has been able to find a way to change so frequently. Um, but also, I think we're getting better at testing and sequencing and, and, and putting dots together. Uh, and that's where we come today to say, hey, the diversity within PERS, it's huge. And I think we're just getting into, we're just scratching the, the surface in the sense that with flu, just to use an example, we knew that uh, there's a huge diversity. I think we're getting to that level with PERS, you know, because now with whole genome sequencing, we're looking at different parts of the, re of the virus. And we can see that uh, diversity-wise, the virus that your farm had today if I go back in six months or in, in, a, in a year, it's going to be different. Or uh, from a single outbreak, uh, another project that was led by Mariana Kikuchi, uh, actually from Brazil, um, she went ahead and she collected blood samples from every single pig in a, in a good amount of liters. And she repeated that sampling three days after that, after the first one. And she could find already that the virus was changing. And not at the OR5, which is the one that we use all the time, it's in the OR4. So we say, okay, so we can see that the virus is changing in three weeks. Again, we need to do some more analysis of those samples down into the nursery and then into the finisher. So what that tells me is that the virus is gonna continue to change quickly in a short period of time. And that's why sometimes it's so hard to understand dissemination. Having said that, uh, Mariana went ahead and used the MSHIM database and uh, she started looking at clustering when it comes to how many outbreaks can I see in the same window of time in a specific region. And she was able to certainly find uh, clusters, that's what we call the spatial and temporal clusters, um, in which, yeah, depending on the window of time she would use, she would see more or, or fewer cases. Uh, but within that cluster, we would see that there were different viruses, yeah? So now, of course, we, we tended to see more of the same virus uh, within the cluster than outside of that cluster. So we, we can tell, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, uh, that kind of makes sense because when a cell farm breaks, they're gonna, they tend to send pigs to specific locations. And sometimes those specific locations may have some cell farms as well in there. So we think that maybe, because they, that region is so overwhelmed with growing pigs, shedding virus, they may generate an outbreak, maybe. So we say, oh, the kind, this kind of makes sense, of course. But uh, now we know that in a specific region, in a specific window of time, we'll see more cases. What we need to really, really understand is um, that diversity when it comes to what if I'm vaccinating or if I'm not vaccinating or what happens when I, when I mix two populations with two different viruses? Is recombination going to happen? Yep, there's some data out there that shows recombination. So that complicates even more the diversity. So when we have that kind of scenario, Marshall, we're just going to be uh, fighting against a virus that continues to change, that, uh, that doesn't generate a very solid immunity, so we're going to have to find ways to avoid those recombinations and those uh, introductions as best as we can. Otherwise, we will just continue to drown ourselves into a huge sea of purse diversity, which I think that's where we are today. What is that um, point 
where the difference in the genome uh, is meaningful? That's a good question, Marcia, and and, uh, and I think there's still the ongoing discussions on whether, for example, at the O5 level, uh, some people use 2%. So if you're different by 2%, okay, I can call it a different virus. Well, depending on who you talk to, they'll say, I can leave this, I can leave this virus in this population of pigs for a year uh, without any introductions, and I can come back later on, and it may have changed already 2%. Maybe not in a year, maybe a little longer. Is that a different virus? Maybe not, you know, maybe not. It's just being there, just replicating itself, changing as viruses do, specifically this kind of viruses. Uh, so that's when we have a, a gap on, a, on agreement of what's a different virus. And I think that's sometimes tricky to define, right? Now, with uh, whole genome sequencing now, we're gonna increase that, uh, how would you call that, that diversity, complexity, if you will, in the sense that we're gonna, go, we're gonna be looking at the whole virus, but still, that's gonna help us understand, okay, this was the same old virus, the thing is that it just changed by this much in this specific section of the virus, right? So it, it can be tricky. Interesting. Do you think the 2% is a good ballpark or would you rather be at a different percentage? You know, much I, I think to start with, we have to start somewhere. And I think that's, I think that's, a, that's a, a, a good start point, you know, mm-hmm. because if you have a good history of your, of your herd, uh, for example, filter farms go through that process, you know. Filter farms, yeah, we know that they're in the highest uh, density uh, throughout the country. They get introductions every now and then, uh, but because they have a good uh, history of what has happened, uh, whenever they see a 99.5, they'll say, yeah, it's still the same virus. Even if they go to 98.3, but they haven't had any clinical outbreaks, they'll say, this might still be the same virus we saw a year and a half ago. So we shouldn't worry about this one, right? So I think that's, that's a way to start, you know? Uh, I, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a good way to, to guide the conversation. How about Seneca virus? What, what's going on there? Uh, what, what is the recent um, evolution there from a prevalence standpoint, risk factors, and other insights? Yeah, Marcin, that's a disease that, uh, that is a pretty interesting disease. M- might not be in the top three for the, for the practitioner today or the producer today. It costs some headaches, you know, because whenever you see some blisters uh, you get scared you know and uh, nowadays we know that yeah Seneca is prevalent within the U.S. but still they need to do the whole process and report it and they're going to go through the FAD investigation Um, but we know that it's out there I think it's kind of at a a low level you know so a student uh, uh, Guilherme Preis he conducted this very large seroprevalence study uh, involving both breeding herds and uh, and growing finishing herds, and it was hard to find the positive herds. You know, it's uh, he collected thirty blood samples per farm and ran some serology, and it wasn't it wasn't that easy to find it. So that tells us that the virus persists in the population at a low farm prevalence. You know, and then as he was collecting all these samples. Um, he also conducted a survey trying to find those factors that could explain occurrence. And because we had a low prevalence, it's hard to find risk factors that can associate to, to this disease. But there was one that came up that comes up with every different, uh, with many different diseases, which is uh, rendering. Rendering is one of those that, uh, that continues to show up regardless of the disease. So that's, that might be something that it's uh, worth investigating a little bit more uh, in, the next few, in the next few years, just because it, it continues to show up unless it's a proxy for another practice that we have at the farm level. Now, given that we have such a low prevalence, we said, well, why don't we start understanding uh, once those breeding herds break, how much, how much time do they need to start producing negative pace, right? So we're just in the very early stages of that project right now. We can see that we can detect it through processing fluids. Uh, 10, 15 weeks after the break, we can see it. 
by PCR. Uh, and I think the next phase of that is going to be the growing phase. What happens to those growing phase? Are they positive? Do they bring that virus into the growing, uh, into the growing side? So that'll be another piece of information that we will need to fully understand Seneca, because that's another one that pops up uh, in, in different parts of the country, you know. And then you'll see our graphs, you know. There's kind of a kind of a seasonality, you know. To me, it's not very clear yet, but we tend to see more of those breaks during late summer, early fall. Uh, some people uh, suggest that this could be a vector-driven uh, disease. It maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't have any data to, to say uh, whether it is or not. So I think this is one that we really need to understand just because we need to have all of our team of veterinarians out there paying attention to this disease just because of the resemblance with FMD. You know, we don't, we don't want to be complacent with uh, Seneca just because it just, you can have a, you can be before an FMD outbreak and then assume it's Seneca, but it was actually FMD and then you don't do enough to contain it, right? So I think we need to still understand a little bit more on that. Uh, this fastidious and hard, I mean, this is a very hardly virus to kill outside its host, right? So uh, I think there, there, there'll be more projects coming on, on, on that area. How about ASF and the secure food systems that, that you are involved? If you can share some, some insights there. Yeah, so this is this is a nice group that it's uh, that it's led by Drs. Marie Culhane, Tim uh, Goldsmith, and uh, Carol Cardona at the University of Minnesota. I, I joined them recently, um, and uh, and one of the one of the main objectives of the group is trying to help uh, the industry understand the risks, you know, by conducting risk assessments at different levels. So the wean pig, the boar stud, the pig that goes to market. And I think the, the whole essence of this, of this is trying to facilitate or trying to provide the guidances for producers and, of course, for the, for the regulatory agency that if we are before an emergency, let's have all those documents, let's have all those processes ready so that people can continue to bring their pigs to the slaughter plant, right? Basically, continuity of business. So by helping the regulatory agencies and the producers and practitioners understand these risk assessments, we will also be able to develop or help them develop all these procedures, you know. Uh, just because we don't want to go through a COVID-like situation, you know, in which people just couldn't send the pigs to market. So they had to do bad things. That, that, uh, I mean, they had to go through the bad situation of uh, destroying pigs. We don't want that to happen with ASF. So that's why... The faster we get those procedures in place, the faster we have everybody understand the risk, uh, the risks, uh, or yeah, the risk assessments. The better we're going to be once this ASF outbreak occurs, so that those neighboring farms can continue to send pigs to market. Of course, they're going to have to go through some testing. They're going to have to go some through some biosecurity validation, but at least we're going to give them the tools to be able to act quickly. You know. And, uh, and avoid getting to that uh, welfare issue that uh, we don't want to go through that again. Do you think if in the worst case scenario, if ASF do enter um, the US, and like you said, knock, knock on wood, would um, uh, right now, do you feel pretty confident on a very quick and effective response based on what you know from the regulation side and, and also from the disease? Or there is also a chance they could get a little out of control for a period of time. You know, Martin, that's a hard question to answer. But uh, from my experience and from knowing uh, the system that I, that I enjoy working with, of course, I enjoy working with everybody, but uh, those that I've been able to work very closely with, I can see that everybody within each system uh, is willing to help and fast. You know, if you tell producers, you need to depopulate this site tomorrow, they'll do it. Mm -hmm. the, my concern is a speediness of communication between, between the regulatory agencies and the producer and the, the implementation, you know, um, because there's still a lot of uh, gray areas, for example, as a, how are we going to kill all these pigs if we need to, right? 
what are we going to do with all these carcasses, right? Are we going to bury them? Are we going to, how are we going to move them? Those, those kind of details are still not very well understood. But once you have that organized, I know that producers, because they do that all the time, you know, whenever they have a, an emergency at their barns, they'll solve things. They're really good at solving things. Uh, an example of it is whenever you have a snowstorm, yeah, some people have issues with their, with their roofs and they lose half a barn. Well, they will depopulate the barn right away uh, and they, they will solve the problem. The same thing with ASF, you know, they're really good at implementing and fast. So I think that once we have that organized, I think we're going to have a good shot at, uh, because we, we will only have one shot, you know, at this, you know, because if it, knowing the amount of pace that we move today between across the, the state line, it can get very tricky. However, I think we have a great uh, group of veterinarians out there that are training their people. Of course, we can always be better at everything, but I think we may, we may be in a better position than some other countries. So I'm more optimistic, Marcio, if that, uh, if that uh, emergency occurs. Um, but before getting to the emergency, I'm, I'm also optimistic on, I think we have somewhat a good system in place on uh, how to keep that virus out, you know? Uh, even though history has told us that, yeah, it's been in the Americas, especially in the, in the Caribbean and uh, in South America. I mean, ASF got there. It looks like history told us that uh, it came to a commercial airliner. Uh, well, today I think we've been doing a little bit more of the education. Yeah, we may have some, every now and then people trying to smuggle pork into the U.S., right? Mm -hmm. but I think we're getting better at it. So I think... Uh, I think everything is falling into place. I hope we don't have to see ASF in the U.S. You know, that would be bad for the whole industry. But if we get it, I think our team uh, uh, of veterinarians, of uh, state veterinarians, everybody's kind of getting in the same page as far as what needs to be done. Yes, we know that there's differences between states and, uh, and every state wants to do their own plan. I think that's in the process of getting simplified, I hope. Uh, for the for the benefit of the industry, so I'm I'm more on the optimistic side, you know, but more on the optimistic side, especially on the on the way that uh, we may be able to keep it up. You've been doing some research on the biosecurity and compliance, you know, which is an amazing area. I think, if I if I recall correctly, about a ten or fifteen years ago, Dr. Steve Dritz did some research uh, within a production system, and if I recall, it was like. Five dollars a pig a difference, you know, if you're following the practices or not. How far are you into that area, and what what do you find so far? And uh, not that far, Marcia, not that far because it's uh, it's it's tricky to get done. It's tricky to get some funding uh, because, like you said, biosecurity measuring biosecurity, it's it's kind of tricky. Uh, one, and uh, it's not as objective as a. Uh, uh, implementing a vaccine or implementing a medication program that you can put the cost pretty easily to it, right? The cost benefit. Uh, here with the security, you're always spending, right? You're always spending on on your baker, on the disinfectant, on the showering, shower out, on the pair of boots, on the clothes. So you're spending a lot. Um, so putting the numbers to it is a little bit tricky. However, you can see systems throughout the United States that invest in biosecurity. Uh, and have lower incidence, right, of disease. Uh, of course, we can't say that it's all because of biosecurity, but I think it, 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 it's a good portion of it. And ex another example is uh, filtering, you know. Filtering, uh, yeah, you may keep the viruses out for those that are airborne, but also behavior changes, right? Because once you, put, you install the filters, the whole team in that farm, we're going to have to follow a specific procedure for everything, you know, from coming onto the farm to weaning the pigs, to bringing in the gills, to getting out the deads, et cetera, et cetera. So those procedures change. And I think that's where compliance gets into, you know, because unfortunately, and, and some people may have heard uh, me saying this, that the worst thing that can happen to a pig farm is having humans around mm -hmm. in the sense that, uh, Unfortunately, most of the processes, if not all, are human-driven. 
And you know this, Marcio, when, when you have people at the feed mill or when you have people breeding sows, uh, why, does this, why are there farms with the same genetics, uh, the same uh, semen source, not performing at the same farrowing rate level, right? Just because in one farm they do the, uh, a better process than the other farm. Same thing happens with biosecurity. And I think today we're living that same scenario with COVID. Some people are really good at washing their hands, wearing their mask, trying to avoid a, a large crowds, et cetera, et cetera. Others are not, and they just get infected. So with pig farms, we've done, we did a very a small pilot project uh, with a clinic with, uh, with Dr. Sprunk, uh, in which we took advantage of a camera that had been installed on a farm, and we were looking at the bench system, right? So the bench system at the entrance of the farm, uh, we knew what the procedure was, we knew what the expectation was. So we said, let's just look at it during the morning, how do people behave? Do they respect the bench or not? Do they follow the procedure? Yes or no? So we did that for 21 days. Interestingly enough, every single day, we would see non-compliant events, right? by either men and women, regardless of the day of the week, whether it was a week or weekend. Um, one thing we did find is that if you, were go, if you were going to the bench by yourself, you tended to cheat, mm. uh, because I guess it's, it's cheating, uh, versus going to the bench as a group. Mm -hmm. so I guess this is kind of the group shaming factor, you know, mm. uh, that I don't want anybody to see me, uh, so I'm going to behave. So I think that's telling me already that if this is happening on a farm with this very simple biosecurity measure, I wonder what's happening when I'm dealing with uh, the dead pigs, uh, loading pigs, unloading pigs, uh, the, the, the DND room. So I really want to get into more details when it comes to what's happening in the different areas of the farm, just to see where do we have the gaps, where do we have the opportunities, because at the end of the day, we need to continue to train our people and we need to get them on the same page so that compliance gets pushed up as much as we can so that we can keep all those bugs away from the farm, right? Because today we have the question of how did the virus came into the farm? And maybe we do a, lot, a very nice investigation, but thus we, don't, we never get to compliance, right? We never, go, we never get to, yeah, there's three or four non-compliant events in the last uh, 10 days. And uh, that, that may be the answer for certain breaks. From that data, which is extremely interesting, right? And probably not too surprising, but maybe a little bit. <laughs> the question is, uh, is anyone already taking some action when it comes to changing any type of procedures to implement on top of that research or not yet? You know, I think so. No, yes, we actually had uh, last year during the Lehman Conference, we had the Swine Disease Eradication Center Symposium um, dedicated, devoted to biosecurity. And we had, I think it was three companies sharing their experiences with different, different ways of the technology. One of them had uh, cameras in which uh, a lot of, they had kind of a team looking at the cameras, assessing all these uh, actions. And if something went wrong, they would email the farm and say, hey, you did that, you need to fix this so that this doesn't happen again. So it's feedback in real time, which I think that's the best thing to do, right? The other one was understanding people movement throughout their farms, throughout their system. And I think they're going to, what they were trying to accomplish is first understand how people move between farms but also try to come up with a system to avoid uh, or to keep people from going onto farms that they're not supposed to go uh, onto just because they were coming from a, I don't know, a farm with diarrhea. They would want to have those individuals go onto a GDU unit, for example, you know? Uh, so I think there's already some companies using that. Now there's, there's uh, other technologies like uh, people, have been able to install a beacons or some sort of technology to follow individuals around, you know, try to understand uh, that little network within the farm and see whether that can be related to infectious disease outcomes, right? So I think there's something out there that uh, is going to get us closer to. 
to me, even though these technologies are going to work, to me, it's more about the personality of the individual, you know, uh, and, and I do that, I do this at home, you know, if, if, if we have, if you look at myself and my wife, she's way more disciplined than I am, mm-hmm. to be honest with you. <laughs> that might not be a surprise for some, um, <laughs> but if we have this mindset that we need to be disciplined for specific tasks, I think that's where we're going to start changing uh, this pattern of, of the seizure currents, right? It, and again, I go back to the COVID. How come people at the hospital, the nurses, the, the, the physicians, are not getting infected? Well, because they're following their procedure. I'm not saying that none of them get infected, but I mean, today we have a, 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 a bless their hearts, you know, they have, we have people that risk their lives, but they feel confident that they're going to be good if they follow the procedure, you know? That's an example number one. Example number two is Ebola. When we had the outbreak of Ebola, they follow a procedure and they kind of contain the outbreak. Why? Because everybody was compliant with what they needed to do. So I think that's the one thing that, uh, that I think we may have opportunities in the field, you know? What doesn't help is that we have some turnover rates that don't go well within our farms and that doesn't help. So we need to retrain people and sometimes we hire the wrong individual, uh, or sometimes we have a COVID positive individual that doesn't come to work and somebody has to uh, do the tasks that this individual was doing, and maybe they make mistakes. So those are the kind of situations that happen in our farms that they may not help. And unfortunately that day, first was able to get into the farm or PD gets into the farm. This is awesome. So before we wrap up here, Dr. Corson, and go into the three questions that I ask every guest, one final question I have here is, what is one thing that you believe that many people disagree? And the reason I ask that is because I think our industry is very homogeneous, right? Very fast, learn and, and implement very fast, which is great. The downside sometimes, I think uh, we may fail, I think, to uh, expose a few of the things that a lot of people disagree and sometimes that's where innovation comes from. So is there something that you, you believe that a lot of people would say, ah, yeah, no, I, I disagree with that? Oh, that's kind of a tricky one. And several come to mind and, uh, and uh, oh, that's a tricky one. And one of the things that may come to mind is the production system from a, uh, grow finish standpoint yeah growing pay standpoint by by say what i what i mean by that is i keep hearing uh, different comments as far as a uh, wing to finish is better than nursery and finishers you know uh, so, so i keep hearing back and forth back and forth and everybody has their own numbers everybody has their own uh, justifications so i i have been seeing in the last years that that conversation which is awesome you know because everybody has their own data everybody ha- can get the systems to work uh, whereas others can't you know so i think that disagreement forces everybody to become good with what they have mm-hmm. and, and i think that's that's very very rewarding in the sense that you have to work with what you have and you can make it work so i think that that could be one you know that that, that comes to mind you know Right, but do you have a take on based on everything? You've, and I agree, like in that scenario, right? You can make it work if you get good at it, right? Which is great. From the different situations that you've seen, are the data? Would do you have a take? If it was a completely new system or flow, what would be your take? Oh, much. That's a. That's a. I think I can be in the middle. You know, I think I. I think I, I may go both ways. You know, just uh-huh. to so that I can do my own comparisons. I know that if I had all the money in the world, I would have both the nursery and the finisher on one end and then the wing to market barn and the other end. And just compare, you know, and let them let them go through time, have enough uh, uh, batches of pigs go to those buildings right. and then come up with a, with a, you know, I'm kind of trying to put a little bit of science so that in my environment, I can measure which one of those two is going to be the one that, actually works better uh, because I can have the best building, the best uh, flow, 
but because of my people or because of my environment, it may not work in my region, you know? So, uh, yeah, so I would go maybe that way if I had all the money in the world, right? Right, right. Very good. So on the three questions, uh, Cesar, the first one is what's your uh, favorite swine related book or resource? You know what? I think I have a couple. You know, one of one of them it's, and I'm sure you hear a lot of uh, a lot of people talking about the swine diseases book, right? But I also like to go to the AASB platform where they have a library. So mm -hmm. if if you're if you're an AASB member, you can go into their library, and then you have a vast amount of information there, from IPBSs to layman conferences to AESB conferences, all of them abstracts, plus the, the JSHAP, the journal. So I think those are two of my go-to areas for yeah, when, I'm, when I'm looking for, for information. Awesome. How about a book or a resource outside of agriculture? Outside of agriculture, Marcio. Well, this might still be within agriculture, but uh, there's a book that I've been reading which is called Pandemic. Okay. You know, and it's a, uh, this, uh, I forget the, the, the author. Um, it's, a, it's a reporter that uh, she goes through the different pandemics, you know, since uh, cholera, since Ebola, I mean, cholera, Ebola. Wow. And she tells the story about these pandemics. And I think, uh, and the reason why I started reading that book, it was just because we were within COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and after, and after getting my PhD in, in influenza, after seeing the pandemic, I said, well, let's, let's go and read about the historical events, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting to see how she develops the very, from the very first case in a specific region and how that gets disseminated. Uh, because it kind of replicates all the time, you know? People travel through, uh, around the world. Uh, we don't do any quarantine. Uh, we just go from Los Angeles to New York within a few hours, and then we jump to, I don't know, uh, China, Japan, and then we go back to Europe. Well, no wonder why we have all these diseases going around the world, you know? So that's, uh, that's kind of my book lately that kind of makes me put everything together and say, okay, no wonder why we're seeing what we're seeing today. Right. And, and I mean, COVID was, was a tough one, right? But at the same time, do you think especially as you looked at these other older pandemics and maybe future ones, right? Do you think COVID was not as bad as it could have been? I don't know, Marcio. You know, that's a good question. I don't know. I think, uh, I think it's really bad, you know? And, and when I say bad, it's from a, from a dissemination standpoint. I can't recall of a pathogen being disseminated so quickly in such a short period of time. Of course, today it's a different world. We have so many planes going from one continent to another, uh, but still within the country, you know, when you look at the United States or other countries, it, it's, it's amazing how one virus it's, has, is so well prepared to infect others, you know? So I think it's, uh, it, it has been bad already. Now, Depending on, on the country you look at, and, and, uh, and I don't want to get this too complicated, it's interesting to see how the different societies behave. So some of them were really, really aggressive. People were really, really compliant. There we go with the compliance. And they kind of shut it down very quickly. So we have the, the example of uh, New Zealand. You know, I think Canada falls into that. They were very compliant, and they kind of shut it down somewhat quickly. Whereas in other countries, it, it just, we, we didn't, we weren't able to get on the same page, follow the same recommendations and contain it, right? So now, I guess today with, with uh, the amount of cases we're having on a daily basis, I think we're losing the battle, right? And again, it's just compliance. It's all about compliance. We're not complying, we're not on the same page. So we're just giving all the tools to the virus to win the battle. Right. Knowing everything that you know about viruses, um... And let's say, I think I checked the, the case fatality rate recently is being around 5%, if I'm not mistaken, for COVID. What would take, right, for that virus to become a 30% or 40% case, case fatality rate? Well, Marcia, I think co-infections 
will help. You know, I think co-infection, well, let me step back. If virulence, you know, virulence, well, if it's a virus that uh, even though it causes a lot of damage within the human body, the inflammation is really, really strong. Uh, but if it does that, if it does that at a higher level, I mean, it'll kill people way, way faster. Uh, of course, on top of that, we're going to put all the risk factors as obesity, if you're a smoker, if, if there's any other underlying health conditions. But violence will play a role. Uh, together with that, I think we'll be looking at co-infections. And, you know, and uh, we're pretty much waiting to see what's going to happen with, uh, with the flu season. You know, if both flu and COVID start circulating, well, we're going to have a, a a tough time, you know, and just, and again, I use all these examples between pigs and humans. When you have PERS and you have flu, those pigs don't, won't thrive and some of them will die, right? Or just PERS and mycoplasma. Same thing with, uh, per, uh, sorry, COVID and uh, influenza. I think that's, uh, that's going to be a, a tough one as well. Again, we are today before a susceptible population, right? So we have no immunity of any of any sort. Uh, so we're always in a disadvantage, right? It's not with flu, you know, that, that there always seems to be an underlying immunity in there that may help at least mitigate this impact, you know? But today we don't have that. So I really hope it doesn't get to that level, you know, because uh, today our hospitals are kind of starting to crash, right? So, yeah. Very good. And then the last one is, what, in your experience, uh, sets apart successful swine professionals from those that are not? I think I can answer that in so many different ways, but I feel like and what I've learned from both my master's and PhD advisors and uh, those professors that I've had to, that I'm, I'm so happy to have had the chance to interact with is, I think the more you put every situation in a scientific context in which you can make the decisions uh, based on hard data, well-collected data, I think that's when you're going to start segregating uh, those two groups, you know. Because on one side, you're going to have the individual that has a lot of experience, that he feels like uh, this one product cures all these diseases, uh, but no data. And then on the other, on the other hand, you're going to have maybe a younger individual that has been uh, very careful at collecting the data, analyzing the data, maybe not that many cases, uh, but then he's going to be able to prove just with trends that the specific intervention is going to have an impact. So I feel like the, the more you get closer to a scientific method, the better, uh, because it's going to work for anything. And you know this, Marcel, because we can use that for nutrition, we can use that for reproduction, we can use that for health, uh, even for welfare, you know. So th- the more you get to that kind of uh, hard data, well-analyzed, well, I guess, experimental design will play a role. I think that's when we're going to have to start. And of course, you have to listen to others, right? Practitioners, producers, because at the end of the day, they are the ones that spend quite a lot of time in, in the barn, right? So you need to listen to them as well. Right. Uh, what, what is that quote? If you don't have data, you are just another person with, with an opinion. Exactly. There you go. No, I love it. I mean, uh, just the understanding of right association and then uh, cause and effect and what is the importance of randomization, right? Uh, in some type of situations, right? I, I mean, I have, I, I mentioned this before, but it's it's kind of striking, right? You have... I think 99% of the population maybe would watch this Netflix documentary about, you know, plant-based diets and think, uh, and, th- and maybe think that's true. And my point is today we can, we can prove anything. If you, anything that you want, you can prove based on a single given study. But the question is, it is a strong study, a weak study, just association or not? Was it randomized or not? What is the control versus the treatment, right? And and the bot and I kind of sometimes I dig into this human nutrition type of thing to, just to learn. But today, anything compared to the standard diet is better. But but now you have 
30 diets and all of them are better than the standard diet. They stand what's called standard American diet, just, the, you know, some junk food or whatever. So th that's just one example of, uh, it's kind of tough. You have exactly. To exactly. I mean, and, and we don't have to go that far, Marcia. Today we see uh, Pfizer claiming that uh, their vaccine, the COVID vaccine is 90%, uh, uh, I think they call it efficacy. And now we have another company saying, I think it's 92% or, well, we need to really understand what that means, you know? And I'm sure that these are very serious companies. They're trying to be careful with how they advertise their outcomes, uh, but we still need to go and understand how they got it done. What does efficacy mean? Uh, just so that we can try to massage those numbers and really make uh, ourselves with, uh, with an opinion, right? Before we start saying, yeah, this one is better than the other one, right? But for sure, this this might be an easier comparison, I guess. Right. Like how many times were you driving, going to a farm and someone said, hey, we ran a trial. And then the first question for me, sometimes, depending on the, on the, the background there or not, but it's like, okay, what do you mean? Because, right, trial, research, test, and all those things. Oh my gosh, right? Tell me exactly what you did. And in my mind, I'm going to, okay, that's an actual trial or, that's not even a trial. So it's it, words get they get thrown around, and you're like, okay, what what is that? How much meat is there in there? Yeah, and and, and the other approach that I'm sure you have seen many many times, Fabi, is the before and after. Mm -hmm. so Marcia, when when you have these good diets that uh, somebody said I'm going to increase the lysine or whatever it is, they say from September onwards we have the new diet. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens with uh, herd health. You know, from September onwards we use this vaccine. And they start, the trends start to change and they make the conclusions. Well, we need to be careful with those kind of approaches. You know, I'm not saying that they're really, really bad. No, I think that's a start. But in the end, we need to, like you said, the randomization, we need to make sure that we control for all these variables so that we can come up with a, with a sound conclusion, you know, a sound result so that we can make those decisions. Right. You, you can get, uh, like you said before, the, the scientific method, meaning... It can be at a system level or barn level as long as you have enough repetitions, the randomization and block by source and whatever else. You can get very, very amazing data, right? But it has to be done right. Exactly. exactly. And, 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 to, and to do it right, it takes time and some money. And uh, But again, we want the truth at the end of the day, right? So, yeah. I love it. This has been awesome. Dr. Corso, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Marcel. Imagine if, with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven-week-long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.